10 feet out in the ocean, turn around, a wave tries to kill me. Now you have something to prove. Now, <laughs> now I have something to prove. Now, now prove I'm going back and I'm going to snorkel every freaking day. And when I get under there, Eat the I'm going to, whoa, hey, they're telling me it's time to start. It's, it's Keith Explains time again. So this month, this month we're talking about the Maker's Fair, which was like a month ago for me. But for you, it'll be like three months ago, if you even heard of it. Because truthfully, most people I know didn't hear of it. And I know a lot of geeks, which are pretty much the target audience. So I'm like trying to explain what this thing was to people. Because I was like, I went to the Maker's Fair last week. And they're like, oh, really? What was it? And then I was trying to, you got to be able to, you know, when you're talking about things, come up with a very short capsule summary of them. And here's my capsule summary. It, it's like a county fair, but for nerds. <laughs> Which is, you know, they rent a pavilion somewhere, and then they invite a whole bunch of people that are pretty much nerds and geeks. And they're like, hey, nerds and geeks, come here and show stuff. And the nerds and geeks are like, but what would we do? And then you're like, just do what you normally do. And they're like, play D&D? &D? And we're like, no, no, that's... <laughs> That's the next weekend down in San Jose at like, Kublai Khan Con or whatever it was. No, like, you must do things on the weekends in your houses. And like, yeah, we, we make stuff. And they're like, bring it down. You can show people how you make things. And, and, and they all came and they like filled up a fairground of just all the buildings filled with people who made things and, and what they were and cool things. And someone else, th this wasn't my description exactly. I've, I've made it kind of, kind of you know... I, I put my own spin on it. Someone was like, it's like Burning Man, but without the naked. <laughs> and I'm like, well, and if you had to keep one, you know, of cool stuff or naked, I guess given that you wanted kids to come, you picked the right one. But you got to think somewhere else. Could you do the opposite? It's, it's like Burning Man without the art stuff, which would pretty much, I think, just be the naked. But I don't think anyone does that. I mean, someone will write in. They'll be like, oh, yeah, it's uh, August 17th in Ohio. It's <laughs> Naked Con. <laughs> I wonder if NakedCon.com is available. I'll have to go look. Because I, you, you can make a lot of money with that domain, I bet. Any, Maker's Fair. So we went up there. And it's, like I said, it's just building after building full of, of people that have done things creative things with their brains and their hands and stuff and so we're just we're wandering around looking at stuff talking to people about what they're doing and there's kind of a couple categories you can divide it into there's there were the people that did things just for art's sake like there was a guy who made a life-size mousetrap game <laughs> I suppose it's actually bigger than life-size because mousetrap was a game where you're supposed to capture a mouse and so you know there's a basket that comes down to the mouse at the very end of the game so you figure a mouse is you know like yay big so the the mousetrap game you can buy from Parker Brothers is maybe like a third size. Because like if you scale it up by three, you could catch actual mice with it. If the mice were blind and deaf and kind of feeble of mind to like not notice that this huge Rube Goldberg contraption around them was conspiring to trap them underneath a plastic yellow basket. But no, here's a guy, nice guy, we met him talked to him for a bit, who, who thought to himself, I have all this time in my life, weekend upon weekend upon weekend of days and weeks, and I, I have a warehouse out back which is just not full enough of things. <laughs> so how about if I go out and buy many tons of steel and welding equipment and paint and other things, and I construct a, a mousetrap game which is large enough that it could trap actual people. So it is scaled up to huge proportions. It is 60, 70, 80 feet from side to side and requires an 18-wheel tractor to, to carry from place to place. And it takes a week to set up. You know, I, I will get to a venue a week before anyone else and I will, with my heavy metal hammer, you know, metal hammer, drive spikes into the ground so that I can show to people a huge mousetrap game. And the first question that occurred to me was, wasn't the whole purpose of the mousetrap game that you built the game as you were playing it? Like you'd roll and you'd get parts. So you, you've missed the whole mousetrap game part of the mousetrap game. What you have is a demonstration of the end of a mousetrap game. You know, where you turn the little thing and the boot kicks the thing and the ball goes down. The, it, it, 
it's a joy to watch. I mean, it's because you're like, no one in their right mind would build anything that large just to flark. I mean, there are like three places in the world this guy can show this. And the Maker's Fair is one, and the Maker's Fair they're going to have in Austin is the second one. <laughs> so he, there's like one more group of people somewhere that he can do this for, and it's probably Burning Man. And at Burning Man, there's no naked involved, so people aren't going to pay attention. So I, this is a guy who does things just because he wants to do them, which... Which is it's probably the best way of describing the Maker's Fair, which is that people do things there just because they want to, and if you think they're cool, good, and if you don't think they're good, you're an idiot. Or, you know, you're not seeing the point. Huge life-size mousetrap game. We Crowds surrounded it every time they ran, and they had witty banter and stuff. It, it was there, were, there were people that drove around in kinetic pastries. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, kinetic pastries. Such, what a weird word, it's... Imagine you scaled up a cupcake large enough that you could sit in the cupcake shell and then you stuck an electric motor underneath the thing you were sitting on and then you just drove it around the street because it looked cool. <laughs> You'd be like, that's no way, Keith. People would never do that. People did that. And I say people because there were like eight of them. <laughs> Different pastries. And then Loretta's like, well, they, they were originally cupcakes, but then they got a blueberry muffin. <laughs> So they had to change it to pastries because they couldn't be kinetic cupcakes with a blueberry muffin. I mean, you just know in a room full of nerds, like 70% of them will be thinking, muffins are not a cupcake? That's just what? I don't get it. Muffins not... What's that muffin doing? See? But, but kinetic pastries and all the geeks are like, hey, that's funny. Funny. You got the cupcakes. You got the muffin. They had one that was covered with big Prozac pills. Because Prozac's always funny. I mean, I, I don't know what those marketing people were thinking when they came up with the name Prozac. Because that's just a funny word. I mean, I guess it's an antidepressant. So having its name be funny is probably a good idea. But <laughs> I mean, maybe that's why it works. Maybe every time you take a Prozac, you think, Prozac, that's a funny word. Maybe it just, you know, it just bumps you up. Just incrementally makes you a little happier every time. Ah, well. They had, okay, off in the corner, this... This was the thing I enjoyed most of, uh, pretty much, uh, well, I guess not most. This was the, the show I enjoyed most there. They just had these two huge Tesla coils. <laughs> and every hour or so, this guy would just flip the switch and start twiddling these dials, and then the lightning would start going from one to the other, and he'd slowly ramp it up, because he's, he's doing a show. I mean, I talked to him, and I was like, so you slowly ramp it up, like, you know, you got to, like, charge it or something? He's like, no, it charges in about a ten thousandth of a second. I'm like, okay. So he's like, yeah, we could just turn the switch and it'd be arcing pretty much instantaneously. And I'm like, well, why don't you? Because, <laughs> I mean, this slowly ramping up to the lightning going back and forth. I mean, I agree, you know, it builds, I guess, suspense or something. But from my point of view, if they just slammed the lights off and then two ten thousandths of a second later, if there was huge things of lightning going from one to the other, well, first of all, it would scare the bejesus out of me. <laughs> But there'd be a lot of drama there. But anyway, no, he, they slowly ramped it up, and there was the lightning going back and forth, and there was this amazing buzzing. And, and I'm, I'm sitting there in the back of my mind thinking, going, why is it buzzing? I mean, I don't remember electricity making noise. Electricity is like the silent killer, like carbon monoxide, except with electricity. Um, but no, it makes noise, and then I'm trying to think, why would it make noise? And I'm like, well, let's see, you're ionizing air, and it's superheating and I don't know why it makes noise and I'll the guy that does the subtitles will probably look it up and he'll type some crap and put a web page or something I don't know he's got too much free time is what he has <laughs> what else did they have they had power tool drag racing which before we got there I I was really looking forward to the power tool drag racing because I love power tools and I'm not really that hot in drag racing but I do love power tools and so the concept of like a drill just taken off down a long thing or something just was like great. But then we kind of watched the power tool drag racing and it just seemed vaguely, it was like too nerdy. It was like people had spent too much time trying to make power tools race effectively <laughs> down a long wooden track. I mean, I don't know what I'm saying. I mean, these people love their power tool racing because they were like... You know, you'd talk to them about how they made them. Like, yeah, this is great. I took a circular saw, and then I cut this off, and then this piece here is from a something. I don't remember. 
Like, there was one guy that's like, oh, yeah, I built this out of a circular saw and a deer carcass. <laughs> like, Uh-oh. how did you even put those two together in your head? <laughs> I mean, I understand circular saw. I'm not that hot on deer carcass, but okay, I understand some people have deer carcasses around their house. Presumably they're hunters. If they're not hunters, there's a problem. But the hunters have deer carcasses around their house, and you know this guy's like, well, what am I going to do? I got a circular saw and a deer carcass. <laughs> Power tool racing. It, it was amazing. <sighs> what else did we have there? And then... So that, that, those, I mean, there were a lot of other shows there. Really, it's ordinarily most places I go, you can walk through in about a day. Like, it, like I go to MacWorld, and you can, you can waste a good afternoon at MacWorld walking through the exhibit area, and then you're done. Like you've seen it all. Whereas at this place, like we were there for two days. Now, one of the days we were there, we were trying to tape some stuff for another TV show, an actually good TV show, not this one. Don't worry, people. <laughs> um, but. When you're trying to tape things for a TV show, you don't actually see what you're taping. It's amazing because you're so focused on actually trying to get things on tape and lining things up and make sure the audio works and everything that you can't hear a word or actually see anything that's happening around you. Like, we were taping and then, you know, I was like, there was this guy driving around on this homemade Segway. And I was like, look at that guy. He's on a homemade Segway. And I was like... Yeah, he was behind you the whole last two times we were taping things, watching. <laughs> so he was like here. It was. It would have been like if I'd done this, he'd have fallen off his Segway. <laughs> well, he wouldn't have because it's self-balancing. But he'd have flipped over and then flipped back like one of them weeble wobbles or something, while the gyroscopes madly tried to compensate. But like I, like you know, for 20 minutes I didn't pay any attention to him at all because I was busy looking through a viewfinder taping something. Anyway, so then we went the second day, and we actually got to walk around and look at things, and it was, oh, man, there are some really crazy, freaky, smart people in this world. Like, so like, I, I think the most impressive thing I saw that was actually an impressive thing was there was people who had 3D printers. Now, I keep reading about 3D printers because I read geek things, and geeks love the concept of 3D printers because they think it'll allow us to obsolete manufacturers, and we all hate manufacturers because they're big companies, I think. I'm not sure why, but I'm told that we all hate manufacturers. Whereas if we all had 3D printers, when we needed something, we could just have our 3D printer make it. And then we'd have it, and we wouldn't have paid a manufacturer. <laughs> Except for the 3D printer. Although if a 3D printer could make itself, then I could make one for my buddy. So we only one 3D printer would ever be paid for, which is probably why we don't have 3D printers, because the manufacturers are dumb. They're like, if we ever sell a 3D printer, we'll never sell another thing again. So we better not do that. Well, that and the other thing they had, there was a guy that was hacking little Roombas. So like the Roombas, a little vacuum cleaner. I bought one for my house because I buy everything. I mean, I don't use it. My house is messy. But I have a Roomba. It's like I, I could have the Roomba vacuum, but... Truthfully, there's too much stuff on the floor for the Roomba to vacuum my house. So I pay people to come vacuum my house. And I assume they have to vacuum around the Roomba. I mean, it's off in the corner, but they still have to vacuum around it. Anyway, he was hacking Roomba vacuum. So he, like, had a Roomba vacuum that had the little Cylon light in the front that would go back and forth. It would make the noise. And in the back, they had people that made battle robots, which would fight each other. And I'm thinking... All you got to do is get the battle robot people together with the Cylon people together with the 3D printing people. And what we'll end up with is vacuuming, battling robots that can make copies of themselves. <laughs> and then that's pretty much the end of humanity. And I think that's actually the, you know, the Terminator movie guys, they had to spice it up for Hollywood. But it's really the case there's going to be a, a jolt of lightning and, you know, a naked killing vacuuming robots gonna fall on the ground and then go off to kill Sarah Connor is my heartfelt belief it's just it's gonna happen someday someday soon so if you if you're outside and you see a Roomba headed down the street run in the opposite direction because you've pretty much got no time at all before the robots rise and take over and it's the end of humanity 
and then the tanks drive over and crush the skulls. <laughs> That's the thing I remember most about that movie is at the very beginning you see these huge robot tanks which are driving over just huge numbers of human skulls and I'm like, how did all those skulls get in that one place? I mean, suppose you're a person and the robots have risen and they're trying to kill everyone. Why would you go stand near a bunch of skulls to get killed? Wouldn't you run far away so that there'd be kind of an even smattering of skulls? It, 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 sorry, not Maker Fair related. Not, not what I want to talk about. <sighs> what else? So, it, so I said the 3D printers. And it, again, the 3D printer people, they were from like CMU or something. They were like, it, it's open source. We'll give you the plans to make a 3D printer. And I'm like, I want one. Okay, where do I get the plans? And they're like, well, it's about $3,000. And I'm like, well, $3,000, that's a lot of money, but I'd have a 3D printer. What could I do with it? And they're like, well... You can use it to like, you know, it's got little stepper motors and it kind of steps back and forth and can build things up in layers. And I'm like, cool, but what can you make with it? And they're like, well, we're making frosting right now. <laughs> and that, a lot of people would say, okay, cool idea, but it's making frosting. But that made me want it more. Because <laughs> the moment they said we're making decorative frosting with it, I realized there's no practical application for this at all. <laughs> Which means it's perfect for me. Okay, so I'm like, I, I should have one of these because then I suppose I wanted to frost a cake, but I didn't want to bother with the actual frosting part. What I could do is go up to my computer room and I could spend a couple days working <laughs> with like Photoshop or Illustrator or something, laying out exactly what I want the top of the cake to look like. And then, then on the last day, you know, suppose I'm like going to a party on Saturday, like Tuesday, I'd start laying out the cake. <laughs> and I'd work all day Tuesday and all day Wednesday and all day Thursday. I'd probably stay up late Thursday because I wasn't quite done. And then Friday, I'd have to quick run to the store and buy a cake mix and make the cake. And then buy a lot of frosting in the tubes because that's the kind of things they do. And then they were like, well, it would take about five hours to frost a cake. And I was like, that's great. Because <laughs> the problem with most frosting is it's over too soon. Which is... <laughs> You get the thing of frosting and you start spreading and like five minutes later you're done frosting the cake and then all the fun is gone. But this way, you can frost the cake and then you can have it lay out the very intricate pattern on top of the cake. So personally I was sold on the 3D printers and I was like, I, I must buy one. And then they were like, well, but you don't have to use frosting, you can use like epoxy. And then I was thinking epoxy would be terrible on a cake. <laughs> And then it occurred to me you could use epoxy for other things. You could make things out of epoxy because epoxy gets hard and stuff. And they're like, well, you've got to get a long-lasting epoxy. But that's okay because when I buy epoxy, I don't buy the stuff that sets in 10 minutes because I would end up with an awful lot of a third done things that had set before I'd got them, you know, glued and held together and clamped and stuff. So I buy the, you know, hour-long epoxy and I clamp them together. And they're like, or you can use Cheese Whiz. And that, when they said Cheese Whiz, I knew these people were geniuses. I mean, they're at CMU, so they're geniuses to begin with. But they're like, yeah, we've, we've made stuff out of Cheese Whiz, because you can put the Cheese Whiz in the syringe, and it steps back and forth, and it draws things with Cheese Whiz. Genius. Genius. <laughs> See, so now i got to get a 3D printer. So like a couple shows from now, I'll probably be talking about my 3D printer and how it's trying to kill me, you know, together <laughs> with the vacuum. That's my thought. So that, that was the most actually impressive thing. But the, the most impressive, actually non-technical thing I saw, I, I didn't even see the guy that did it. I was just walking down an aisle, and it was just sitting there. And, and there was no one next to it, and there was just one little sign in front of it that said, party size margarita maker. And I thought, what? Because I love margaritas, and I've been invited to a party once or twice. <laughs> they don't invite me much, because when I promise to bring a cake, I never do. But... <laughs> party size margarita maker what it is is it's i don't know about the rest of the world but around here if you see a you know like a pack bell truck on the back of the pack bell truck there'll be this huge orange thermos which you assume is filled with water due to an osha regulation like they've they've got to always have 19 gallons of water nearby in case they're parked under a line and it's very hot and they want water or in case somebody catches fire so they can throw the large thermos filled with water and probably ice at the top because there's probably a rule about how much ice you have to put in every morning or something. But they can throw the large thermos filled with water and ice at the guy who has caught fire because he works on 10,000 volt power lines. And so they have this huge, you know, like three feet around, four foot high thing. And, the, and it says party size margarita maker. And I so the first thing I think is on the empty spot next to this large thermos, there was a thing 
there was a party sized margarita maker and then they would make the margaritas they would put them in the thermos and then when people wanted them they could just push the little squeezy thing at the bottom margarita would come out that'd be great so then i look at the orange thing and i notice there's a power cord coming out the back of it now my interest has been piqued so i lift the lid off and on the bottom of the huge orange thermos there's a garbage disposal which they have built into the bottom of the thermos and then there's a pipe that comes back up about two-thirds of the way up the orange thing and suddenly in my brain i see how it all works i've put it all together because i'm i'm crafty and clever <laughs> see you fill the orange thing with ice and then you dump in probably like you know three bottles worth of i don't know what the, you make margaritas out of probably rum and something red it's <laughs> my assumption I mean, I personally make margaritas <laughs> out of, you buy a bottle of margarita mix, and you get your hand blender, and you pour them together with ice. But not when you're making them on that scale. There's probably actual ingredients or something that you put in. But see this one, you pour the ingredients in, and you plug it in, and see the ice goes into the garbage disposal, which grinds it up, and shoots it back up to the tube. And like five minutes later, you got a huge thermos full of margaritas. And I'm like, genius. These people are geniuses because it it would never have occurred to me to make a large margarita maker in any I mean see I could do this I like looked at this and went I've installed a garbage disposal in my house and I know where to buy a thermos <laughs> and near as I can tell that's all I would have to do I mean I'm assuming there's a gasket at the bottom but I I can do gaskets um, I can do some plumbing I'm not that, I'm not as good with electrical but that said, what else was good? There's, so we're, we're walking down an aisle, and there's a little booth. And again, the place is just full of little booths of people just showing whatever the heck they do. Just crazy-ass things. We, anyway, we get to this thing, and there's, there's a nice, you know, there's a nice woman standing there next to her, another nice woman. They're talking to each other. In front of them, there's a shoe. And I think, shoe okay and then i look at the shoe and it's a high heel shoe a very high heel shoe the kind of shoe you'd well you'd like your girlfriend to wear them but not around other people <laughs> is my main point okay but in the heel of the shoe there's a video screen and i was like wow that's like the exact wrong place you want a video screen because you can't watch tv on your shoes i mean just try it just try standing up and then looking down to see your tv no you can't do it and then we talked to them and they're like, yeah, it's part of a pilot project where we're making shoes for prostitutes. <laughs> and then I, I had to stop because I had assumed my brain had put some other, put the word prostitute in for what they actually said because weird things happen every once in a while. So I was trying to think what sounds like prostitute but doesn't have anything to do with that. And then they kept talking and that's actually what they were doing because they were like, well, because, you know, they, they go out, they're on the streets, they have shoes they're strippers you know they need what if like we could put a gps in it and that way you could track them and i'm thinking why would you want to do that <laughs> i mean mostly they avoid the authorities <laughs> i'm thinking cops you know the tv show would be a heck of a lot more interesting if all they had to do was look at their little computer and go oh they're on fourth and oak today and then they'd go to fourth and oak and arrest them no it was wacky. There was, okay, there was a guy. This I met this guy really early on the, the, you know, when I was walking around the first day, the second day. I like come up and he's sitting at his table and I'm like, "What you got?" And he's got lots of microscope. And I'm like, "Cool." And I look like, I just took a, you know, a cheap webcam and pried this apart and did this and that. And look, you can look at plankton. And I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> and he's like, "Here, I got some." And he's got a big jar of plankton. And he squeezes out an eyedropper and puts him down. He's got a little computer screen. He's like, look, you can see him swimming around. And we're, we're talking about the swimming around plankton and the microscope. And there's no magnification. They're just on top of it. And, you know, we're watching them. And slowly they slow down and then stop moving. And I'm like, what happened? And he's like, well, they're dead. And then he explains that, the, the, you know, the webcam, it's electrical, it generates heat, blah, 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 it has killed the plankton. And now, I didn't want to say to the guy, but I now feel terrible. Because I, 
I have been involved in the murder of Plankton. I mean, it's... I mean, I know I didn't know. I'm probably not morally culpable, but I was there. I could have saved them if I'd known. And then he gave me a little vial. He's like, you could take some home. And I'm like, great. So I took him home and I kept him for like a week. Because I was like, well, they all died, but I can rescue some of them out of the big jar. Because if they stay there, they're just going to die. <laughs> Okay, near that dude. Like, right across the aisle, there were some Linux telescope guys. And I stopped and talked to them. And just, well, because I'm there, and I'm talking to everybody, and they're Linux telescope guys. And I'm like, what are you doing? They're like, well, we're building a big telescope you can control with Linux. I was like, okay, why? And they're like, well, kids, et cetera, et cetera. And the thing I couldn't bring myself to ask, because you can't ask this when you're around Linux people, is... How is Linux involved? <laughs> and they're, they're just building a computer-controlled telescope. I mean, it, it could be run by Windows for all the people connecting over the Internet. No, and it would be exactly the same. It would be, you can go to our website and point a telescope and look at the sky, and that would be great. But, but they're doing it for Linux, which I assume means it's open source, which means I guess I could build a huge telescope, you know, with Linux and look at the sky, but I don't have to because they're doing it. Ah, Linux guys, there's okay, this guy, there was another dude we talked to. This is one of the very first people we talked to when we got there, actually. The first day, he was outside. He's got a bike, uh, kind of a bike. He's got a, it looks like a bike. It's got pedals and a really big wheel and an electrical generator connected to the really big wheel. And he's, he's showing how he can pedal and the generator will generate power. And then he runs it through this electrical rectifier, et cetera, et cetera, thing he's got you know, to get the power, and he uses it to, like, you know, run his laptop and his printer. In fact, he had a laptop and a printer there, and if you wanted information about his thing, you push the button, and then he would have to pedal harder, because with the pedaling he was normally doing, that was enough to run the computer, but it wouldn't run the printer. You know, <laughs> computer plus printer was too much power for his normal pedaling speed, so when you push the button, he'd have to pedal faster, so the printer would have enough juice to spit out a piece of paper to give you to tell you what he was doing. And then it really nice guy, and he's, you know, he's trying to show how you can generate electricity and power to do things around your house. And he's got the car battery. He's like, yeah, I can, I can charge up the battery, so if I don't want to be pedaling, you know, I've got some power to, like, run something. And he's got, like, a TV. And I'm like, that, you know, you can run the TV. And he's like, you've got to be pedaling really fast to work the TV, which... <laughs> I mean, which I think, you know, would work for fitness clubs, except the problem is, see, I, I like to watch, you know, I have a treadmill in my house, in front of my treadmill I have a TV, and I, I have one of them inverted watt things that tells me how much power the treadmill uses, and it uses a lot of power. <laughs> it uses a heck of a lot more power than I can generate with a bicycle, pedaling away as fast as I can. He's like, yeah, it's the same problem, which is to watch the TV, he's got to pretty much be pedaling at, you know, his highest speed, and he can't do that for terribly long, but... He was a really fit-looking guy. <laughs> and I was like, how long have you been doing this? And he's been about two years. And I'm like, you didn't used to be a really fit guy, did you? And he's like, no, no, I didn't. That's, <laughs> that's why he's doing it. I, I really, I got no more time. So the rest of these topics are going to have to wait till next time. So I guess it's, it's been lovely, everyone. We'll see you in a month. So where was I? We were talking about something today.